You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Welcome back, everybody, to episode 47 of Arsenal Pass. I'm Brennan Patrick, joined always by calling champion Hayden Dale. Hayden, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm a... Uh... Got a bit of a blocked nose today, but otherwise I'm I'm doing good. <laughs> How are you, Brendan? Doing good, doing good. Just been super busy these past couple of weeks. Um, yeah. So this uh, this week we're going to be breaking down our week two of ProQuest, and specifically we're going to be diving deep on metagaming. Um, we're going to be talking about our process and how we pick our decks week to week, and extrapolate that on how we plan to pick our decks for things like the calling Indianapolis as well as the upcoming Pro Tour in New Jersey. But before all that, Aiden, I know you've got some good news from this weekend. Tell me about your week in Flesh and Blood. Uh, yeah, I've had, a, I've had a great week. Um, I did a bit of travel this week for work, which took me down to Melbourne, which is just an hour and a half flight south of Sydney. Um, and I got to play a ProQuest on Sunday, which is fantastic. So I played two ProQuests over the weekend, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. Um, played Prism, which I think we're going to talk about <coughs> that decision and why I played that deck. But yeah, managed to managed to nab myself two gold foils, which is pretty amazing. Just a you know ran hot, uh, had a good weekend, had a good deck, and um, overall had a had a lot of fun. So quite a bit of traveling. I drove like an hour and a half up to this ProQuest, and drove an hour and a half back on Saturday, and then flew Sunday morning to the next ProQuest, and then was away for three days and just got it back. So it's been a um, it's been a long week. But I also got to play a Armory event down in Melbourne uh, and meet some like some some people that I know through the community or kind of know um and catch up and meet a few new people as well which is awesome got to play some games there um so yeah just overall i just had a great week in flesh and blood to be honest it's um it's been busy and i haven't actually played that i haven't done any testing or anything but just played games played events how about you well before that speaking about gold foils <laughs> since you mentioned you do have two i saw a poll on twitter um by the arsenal pass account um today I wonder who put that up because <laughs> Looks like there was over 200 votes. This was uh, regarding you opening your gold foil on the podcast. Um, looks like we were pretty unanimously yes. Um, so Hayden, do we have that today or what does that look like? So I, I've opened one of my gold foils. I opened the one I won on Sunday. Uh, I got a number in boots, which they look, honestly, these gold foils look so nice. The other one from Saturday is unopened. At the moment, I want to keep it unopened, but down the track in a few weeks' time, at the end of the ProQuest season, we we might do something. Uh, I don't know. There's something about everyone was opening, and I was like, what if I just keep the sealed and just keep it to myself? And I don't know. So, yeah, we might might end up opening it on the pod, though. But um, maybe we can do yours when you win one this weekend. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just keep it to myself and rob the viewers and listeners of Arsenal Pass. I hear you there. Um, so yeah, my week in flesh and blood, I did play a pro quest on Saturday. I did not get there. Uh, unfortunately, I've been, I was feeling a bit ill this weekend. Um, so I was actually, I was actually pretty happy to go home early, but you know, I'm ready to sort of get back in the saddle. I got one pro quest this, uh, upcoming weekend. That's actually going to be like 60 people, maybe 70. And then I've got a back to back the weekend following that in, um, in Oklahoma. So first one is Edmund unplugged. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna travel up to Tulsa, Team Covenant, and I've got I've got a bone to pick with a few people over there. And I got a I got a trophy to win, to say the least. Maybe a gold foil win. You, so you, Maybe. Edmund's your stomping ground, though, isn't it? Isn't that where you took out your first road to nationals win? So you have to go back and, and defend the territory. Yeah, but in order to get that road to nationals win, I had to you know of course stomp Zach Bun, Tim Bun, you know, just absolutely ruin all of their tournaments. So. I'm really trying to keep up that uh, that legacy, right? right. Going there to Dream Crush, and I got some targets in my sight line. Good to hear. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited. Well, anyway, Hayden, take me into the news for this week. Yeah, well, I want to start with something that's really exciting for us uh, here at Arsenal Pass, which is um, we've currently got a video series that we're doing with Legend Story Studios up on fabtcg.com. Uh, we're uh, looking at a, it's a gauntlet series basically so over this pro quest season Brendan and I are playing some of the top decks in the meta into one another seeing what will come out on top we've got six heroes three games uh, first game dropped on fab tcg already uh, two three days ago by the time this goes up and the next game I think will be up uh, around Monday Tuesday and the final one before the last week of pro quest next weekend um, 
yeah, just a really, we've, I mean, this is such an amazing opportunity that we've kind of been given by LSS to, to do this and we're, we're really excited to do it. And we got to start with uh, Star of the Show versus Prism. Um, I won't spoil anything. You can go check that out, out on fabtcg.com or if you go to the Flesh and Blood YouTube page, you can see that there. But yeah, Brendan, that's kind of, if you're looking for our gameplay videos at the moment for the next two weeks, uh, they're going to be over there on fabtcg.com. And it's, it's very similar to the gameplay that you know that we do on, fa on, um, on our own YouTube page, but a little bit of a difference where we talk a bit more about the matchup in particular um, and how that's planning out over sort of this this progress season that we're seeing. So go check it out. Give us a, a like and support us on uh, over on Fab TCG and the the YouTube page there. We also yeah, have a giveaway. I, oh, sorry, Brendan. Uh, yeah, I just want to say I really enjoyed filming that. Um, it's great. It's an awesome opportunity by Legend Story. Particularly, it's significantly better for me than our YouTube our YouTube videos because Hayden's like actually almost contractually not allowed to uh, get tilted and be mean to me during the game so it's been a great experience so far and i'm really looking forward to these next two me yeah <laughs> they always say they always say hayden brings the salt to the videos <laughs> mm -hmm. that is, i've heard that yeah we have a giveaway Brendan. uh very exciting mm -hmm. while we're on the topic of fabtcg.com and legend story studios we've also been given a golden ticket to give away for the calling indianapolis uh, to one of our, you know, one of you lucky listeners or viewers. Um, also, if you've already purchased your ticket for Indianapolis, you can enter this and actually get a refund, which is really cool. So Alexis have, have told us that that uh, is how that works. So if you do want to enter, please do everyone enter. So basically what this golden ticket is, is your entry to the um, Indianapolis calling. Also gives you entry into the battle hardened event. If you know, uh, for a reason that you end up needing to play that uh, you do get three arcanic shockwave red rainbow foil extended art promos you also get a tales of aria uh, limited edition storage box as well with this golden ticket so if you do want to enter pretty simple uh just here on the youtube video if you're listening on audio jump across to youtube drop a comment down on the youtube video drop a like as well and just tell us what you're most excited about for the calling indianapolis is it uh seeing brendan with the return of the blonde hair uh, or is it something else entirely? Is it a, uh, a new secret tech deck that you're expecting to see? So we're going to draw a winner on Sunday evening PST. So get your comment down on the YouTube before then. Tell us what you're excited about and get yourself in the draw for that golden ticket. And thanks to LSS and FabTCG.com for giving us a golden ticket to give away. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. Really appreciating the support from LSS these past couple of weeks. Looking at the fine print of this, actually, it's really interesting. They wrote... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you comment about Hayden not opening his gold foil on Arsenal Pass, you do you, your your answer might be weighted a bit heavier. Okay, not confirmed, but it is in the document they've shown me. Again, throw us a comment like Hayden said. Um, anything about the meta? Maybe you can throw something in there about the gold foil, but you know, engaging stuff is better <laughs> than not. And of course, just trolling Hayden a bit. So, I want to shout out the Arsenal Pass Patreon. We are at over 500 patrons, which is incredible uh, to think we're actually approaching episode 52 here soon hayden which is incredible to think we've almost been doing this for a year and a lot of it's been possible through that patreon um i looked on our i think it was podbean uh today and it looks like we're at ninety-two thousand downloads so pretty close to 100k i guess that's a benchmark i hadn't really looked at podbean before this but that's exciting to think that this our <laughs> kind of our voices have been downloaded a hundred thousand times it's just a ridiculous number yeah sorry um, sorry to those people <laughs> yeah sorry to them yeah, if you are interested in the Arsenal Pass Patreon, we do have deck text, deck guides, as well as extra podcasts posted on there. So go check it out if you're interested. Specifically, Hayden and I, um, Hayden up until now, but now Hayden and I have been posting our deck lists from the weekend in ProQuest, as well as our sideboard guides um, on what cards to bring in, take out, whatever you need uh, to pick it up and bring it to your event. But Hayden. Yeah. Yeah, there's, um, so I just put up my Viscerai deck list and a cyborg guide that I used for ProQuest Week 1. Prism will be up, uh, I think by the time this drops, it'll be up before the weekend anyway, so you have access to that. So how I was sideboarding over the weekend and the deck list that I played, uh, again, big thanks to, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the, the shout-out to the New Zealand crew who came up with that deck list and shared it. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if you want to get on our community Discord as well, our Patreons, patrons Discord, uh, you can, can do that as well. That's access to all tiers and a lot of discussion going on there about the format currently. Uh, and people sharing deck lists and usually at the the weekend of the event as well always chuck up deck lists but i think actually this weekend brendan um i'm going to share my deck list on twitter and on the discord uh before uh probably tomorrow actually so yeah 
Very original. Nobody has actually done that before. Um, specifically not the champion of the United States. Terry Definitely Patel. not. Definitely no, it's <laughs> it cool to call your shot, though. I do think that's uh, that's a good move. I like it. Well, um, wait till you see the list. So we'll talk, <laughs> okay. we'll talk about we'll talk about meta games and, and heroes later on. Uh, might be a bit of a surprise. And uh, I don't know about calling my shot as opposed to just uh, saying what I like and what I want to play. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, and with the prism side or prism decks that are going up, you're actually going to have two different decks. You have the deck that Hayden played and the deck that I played. They're only different by a few cards, but some sideboard, uh, some sideboard plans are a bit different. So you get two views and sort of our takes on the deck there. Um, just an update on time of the round. We are going to be sort of pausing time of the round from a weekly sort of thing and just do it as we want to. I think you know a lot of this is because I've become quite a bit more busy these past uh, few weeks with some new opportunities, um, as well as I think that there's actually a fantastic other option if you're if you're sort of wanting to to get some your time around fix so in the instant speed podcast flakes podcast i think is you mm -hmm. know, quite similar in terms of like its general scope and i think it's a great execution of that so we'll still be using it as needed for kind of a free form whenever we want to um you know talk about something or talk to other people but yeah that is the status of time of the round at this point with that being said hayden there's nothing better then a nice, warm, the nice, warm smell of burning charcoal under your nose to clear up that cold that you have. So take us over to the Command and Cookout for this week. I can't smell anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. The, I just want to give, before we get into the Command and Cookout, I want to give a quick shout out to one of, you know, you just gave a shout out to the Instant Speak podcast, but one of the best resources for gameplay out there, I think the cleanest edited gameplay out there in Flesh and Blood, yeah. uh, our friends over in Ukraine. Abrika, just want to give a big shout out to them. Um, you know, any best wishes and hope to see them return to uh, YouTube with their amazing gameplay very soon. Yeah, it's literally not even close and it actually never has been. Um, I think I called them out on this podcast back in like episode between 10 and 20, so like forever ago. Um, they've been literally the cutting edge of production value for Flesh and Blood gameplay and they've kept that up for almost a year now. So, if you don't know about them, I recommend I recommend you check them out. They're one of the best channels out there. I think they have I think they have more subscribers than us. So Ooh, maybe like, they, <laughs> yeah. So um, they, they definitely don't need, don't need the exposure. <laughs> yeah, they don't need the exposure. But just a big shout out to them because Hayden and I have been fans for a long time. It's actually what we modeled um, our gameplay videos or layouts off of. So Isn't yeah, it? big shout out. Cool. So if you want to get a question right. in for the Commander Cookout, you can do that through Twitter, drop a comment in YouTube's, you, YouTube's, the YouTube comments. You can uh, add us on various social media. You can send it into our email account. It's um, arsenalpassfab at gmail.com. Um, you can even send a, a personalized postcard to Brendan if you like. But this week's question mm. comes from JJack from the Patrons Discord, which is another way you can get your questions in. So, Brendan, our question this week. It seems like the should I go first question is fairly underanalyzed and potentially has a very significant impact on win rate. What are your rules or heuristics? He's put your favorite word in there, Brendan, just for you. For choosing to go first or second, and what are the most common first, second mistakes you think other players are making? So there's a few parts to this question, Brendan. So first of all, uh, do you agree that the should I go first question is kind of underanalyzed um, in this game? Yeah. Only in the sense that I that it's very dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. Based on your opponent and their deck, um, you know, specifically their deck, not really your opponent as a human being. But sometimes I think you need to <laughs> I think you need to have a plan of what you want to go first or second into um, into like every matchup, right? It should just be a part of your sideboard plan. Some decks only want to go first, but a lot of times it actually does change up. Yeah, so the question, the part, the first part of the question from Jay Jack was like, has a very significant impact on win rate. I think that's very, very true. Um, I can give a really good example of this. So I played Prism in the weekend and going first with Prism and playing double aura on the board, you know, blue aura plus yellow mm -hmm. aura is huge. It is massive. Your game plan almost completely changes from if you're on, the, if you're going first versus going second with that deck, where you're actually quite a bit more proactive when you're going first as opposed to going second. So not only... <clears throat> does it depend on what your opponent's doing but your actual game plan can change and there's even to the point where you know going first versus second uh, will change how i might sideboard in certain matchups you know uh okay i use the prism example again 
uh, going first, I really want like all my Genesis, even against the aggressive decks, but Genesis can be a little bit too slow against aggressive decks when I'm going second. Uh, you know, they can easily clear. It doesn't give me value. It's not as good as like Parable or uh, Oats of Wrath. So that's a really important sort of thing to consider. And yeah, I think it's really underanalyzed. So that's why I wanted to, to pick this question and talk about it. So rules and heuristics, if you just talk about this, first of all, so there's two things, right, Brennan, there's what your opponent's doing and there's what you're doing. Let's talk about what you're doing. Do you have any kind of rules or heuristics about going first or second based on what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely more nuanced rules. Like you, you spoke about the prism. That's probably, it's mostly, it's kind of prism native in the sense that they're the only ones that can double aura like that and get that kind of board advantage. But generally, if I'm going first, um, my game plan is to get an arsenal. So if I'm playing a hand or, you know, a deck that wants to play five card hands, um, then I usually am planning to go first. But again, I actually, you know, I'll sometimes put more weight on what my opponent is doing or what their deck's trying to do. For instance, like if we look at something in this meta, I usually want to go first versus Bravo star of the show. Um, and, you know, worst case scenario, I'm just plopping something, something in my arsenal, holding five cards for the next turn, and they don't get to filter, right? Because the last thing I want that, uh, you know, Starvo doing is potentially filtering, filtering cards to increase their chances of activating his ability um, at the start of the turn. Yep, I completely agree. Yeah, I think from my side, going first or second, uh, the you know, rules of thumb heuristics. First of all, I'm going to start with what I'm doing. What is my plan? Does my plan... Like, is do I want to just be going first all the time? Like, am I playing an aggressive chain deck that wants to race opponents? So I always want that shackle on turn one, and that makes a really big difference to probably like like Jack says, JJX says win rate. But actually, just just my plan in general. Um, how important? So uh, you know, a thing to think about: how important is my card in Arsenal on turn one? So that's all stuff from my side. You know, like what's my plan? But then, what about the other side? Okay. So maybe it's not that important for me. First, second is kind of whatever. What about for my opponent? How important, like you say, star of the show, how important is a card in their arsenal so they can start activating that crown of seeds and digging for that fuse ability, for that uh, bravo ability? These are all things to to really consider. So yeah, if I was to give like, you know, rules, heuristics, start with yourself and then go to your opponent. Like sometimes you really want to go first, but maybe that's actually not correct. You know, like um, traditionally playing into Dedorinthia, it was... You didn't want them to be going second and get the tempo and have that ability. Mm-hmm. You often wanted to, to choose to go second into Dorinthia. Blank that first turn. Yeah, they get an arsenal, but a four versus five card hand isn't very different. And that life and that, that tempo that you can have by going second was often more important, um, and especially when you're playing like mid-range decks or decks like, uh, you know, things like that. So Yeah, I mean, specifically with Dorinthia, it was, you know, I think that you know, four versus five card hand Dorinthia was, the five card is quite a bit more powerful, but... By going by by them going uh, second, you know they're able to actually pressure your hand, and they have this they have this uh, the effect of Dawn Blade is where they get this counter, they get this sort of snowballing effect where it, it really encourages you to block, um, or you you really just have to kind of pay that debt off later when Dawn Blade has a counter. So you really want to prevent them from getting that counter and snowballing the game, and you do that by going second and just sort of blanking that first Dawn Blade. Um, so there's no way that they can get, uh, they can get the counter on there. Yep. Yeah. And I think the last thing, if I'm talking about this, some of these, you know, rules heuristics is what is, and again, these are so gray and they're so dependent on the match, but at least you can kind of work through these is like, if you go first versus if you go second and considering what your opponent's doing, the matchup you're into, what are your hands likely to do? Like, where is the biggest impact coming? So like that example, you know, if I let an aggressive deck go second and they get tempo how impactful like do i need five card hands on my turn or am i co- okay to trade like three cards play my arsenal and be like okay i come back with my two or three card hand and i'm actually ahead on that or you know do i need those five cards so probably maybe going second playing a four card hand arsling gaining some tempo is more important because maybe i have on hit effects maybe i have you know a lot of ways to disrupt my opponent so maybe going second is actually is actually preferable so yeah a lot of different things in there but i think brennan kind of hit the nail on the head it should be part of your sideboard plan into every matchup you should know why you want to go first or second and how you're going to utilize going first or second with your deck into every single matchup and how you sideboard uh, and how you set your deck up with equipment, et cetera. It can really depend on that as well. I actually think that this question is particularly interesting when it, when we start talking about limited, because that's oh, where huge. I think it changes a lot, <laughs> you know, like context of your deck, obviously what your opponent is playing. And then it's like very format dependent. I, I find the first or second question actually quite challenging and limited. Where, you know, in Constructed, I feel like you can really have um, an idea of what you want to do before you enter the match. 
or but limited it's kind of variable in your deck sometimes i mean in some formats it's like okay maybe briar like always wants to go first or something like that but i think in limited <laughs> this question is actually extremely challenging well the, the the payoff in constructed is often so the gulf between first and second is often a bit lessened well at least it appears mm. to be lessened because if you go first pick up tunic get your fifth card into arsenal right always feels like well at least i'm getting some value whereas you go first and limited uh you know you might not even be able to you might be able to filter your hand but then maybe your opponent gets to filter their hand better than you do uh you don't end up with a favorable card in arsenal um it really can depend like in in limited for instance i think monarch wh whether i wanted to go first or second actually changed through that format as people got better at the format in draft initially i wanted to i wanted to to go second and then i wanted to go first after a while because people were getting better at understanding how to build their decks and they could actually punish me if they went first so um yeah it, it really it really depends i think uh, but limited is a super interesting example and i'm sure once we get into the next limited format and we or if we revisit tales we will talk a lot about going first versus second i think in limited yeah 100 percent. Cool. well thank you for the question jay jack again if you do want to get your question in submit them uh and we will try and get it on the show for sure all right hayden let's go ahead and hop into this main topic of the pod a weekend where we both played prism um you were a bit more successful than me maybe by um you know 20 or 30 spots but nevertheless why did you play prism this weekend yeah great question so i guess the the kind of we're talking about metagaming right like this is this is why i chose to play prism and We've kind of split this kind of main topic into two parts, right? Which is like why we played Prism this week and what that meant and talk a little bit about our differences in our list because there were some differences. And then we're going to talk a bit about actually just extrapolating this idea of why we played Prism this week to metagaming for the remainder of the ProQuest and just metagaming in general because I think it's something that's we haven't we probably haven't touched on as much and it's a really important concept. So why I played Prism, uh, yeah, first and foremost is a metagame call and, and why that is is that Coming off last week, uh, Bravo Star of the Show in week two was, uh, week two, week one, sorry, was the most dominant deck by a mile, right? To no one's surprise. You know, we talked about it last week's pod. It won a lot of events. It top aided a lot of events and it was at a lot of events. Um, and we, we saw as well, you know, Viscerai in there as well, doing well, winning some events, and, you know, putting places in top eights. And then we saw Prism. So Prism come through and uh you know win a couple of events and it seemed like the feast or famine for prism like where prism did well it did really well and it won a couple of events and and saw a few top eight spots but it also seemed to be region specific so mm -hmm. just looking at the metagame the first thing was like okay take take a step back like where are we right now starvo like bravo star of the show is just so dominant what deck do i think attacks bravo star of the show the best in my opinion it is these new aura based prism builds i think the matchup is so favorable for prism and then as well, then I go to, okay, well, if I play that, that deck, if I decide to play Prism, what are my other matchups like? Mirror match is really important. It's going to be important because I know other people are going to pick Prism up this week. Plus it was already prevalent last week. Do I have a plan for that? That's got to be included in the list. And then like Viscerai, how, how do we play into that? And then probably Chain and, and Lexi were like the kind of next two cabs off the rank in terms of what was happening in the metagame. So Prism for me, across all those, all those options felt like the right call specifically for this weekend because of it was like i felt that week two was like this is where bravo star of the show is going to be at its peak this is going to be the most played deck this week it might drop off a little bit next week because i expect prism to do well but from a metagame standpoint yeah i want to attack star of the show this week and i want to also have a deck that's just inherently powerful and i think that was prism what about you exactly my thoughts as well <laughs> but um so i didn't have any exposure to what my local meta looked like before this weekend and i got to the event and Almost nobody was playing Starvo. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> What's going on here? Everybody was playing uh, either Viscerai, Prism, or Chain. So I was, I was pretty surprised by that. But the, like Hayden said, it's very region-based. Um, you know, some areas of the U.S. tend to favor decks like Prism, um, which is funny because I think they favor Prism in the same way they favor Dorinthia. Like, it's just a deck that a lot of players are drawn to initially, and they stick to that deck. Um, so I was very surprised to not see as like to see as little Starvo as I did, um, and yeah, like that weekend turns out Prism probably wasn't the play with so many Viscerais uh, and Chains in attendance, and there was a ton of Lexis. So I was like, I was uh, I was very surprised by the amount of Lexis. Interesting. So I think Prism definitely was the correct call this weekend. So it could be. Oh yeah, for sure. I agree with you, but I think in my meta it was a bad call, right? Which right. is weird. But you couldn't have predicted it. It was just like it ended up being the wrong deck for that weekend, which was interesting. So what was the most, was Prism the most represented 
in your field? Yeah, I think so. So what made Prism bad into your field? Like just the amount of viscerai or? Amount of viscerai, chain, uh, viscerai and chain. Um, yeah, I think made it bad. And also, like if you're playing Prism, I feel like you're attacking Starvo. Like you want that matchup to be easy. And if all of your matchups end up being just mirrors and what I think are matchups where you're not favored, which is viscerai and potentially chain, um, then I don't. Th I think you would probably rather be on a different deck in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it definitely felt like for me the reason to play it was like you say, Bravo style of the show. Uh, Pris like I knew the mirror was going to come up, so that was important to me, and it was important to have a plan for that. So that was part of my mm -hmm. metagaming aspect was okay, what what does what tweaks does the list need to to have game into the mirror? I ended up playing uh, I think five mirrors across the two events in the weekend, so you know it was definitely prevalent. Like people were playing it. That uh, was my finals on on Sunday as well, um, so it was it was around right. And then yeah, like you say, like Viserai. Okay, well I felt like Viserai was was close. Uh, I was really worried about Chain, um, but I thought mm. that this weekend Chain wouldn't be as represented as I think it will be next weekend, given just how popular Prism is, which we will we'll talk about kind of the last two weeks and where we see that going. Um, so I want to talk about because we both decided to play Prism, but we both decided to play slightly different lists for a couple of reasons. And I think that was metagame aspect as well. Like I think for you, Brendan, uh, you wanted a bit more of a, just a, a more linear, powerful list. You had some cards that are just generically good, right, in your list. Whereas I think my list, I had a few more cards tweaked to maybe the Mirror um, and to, you know, like Viscerai, for instance. I think I was maybe a little bit worried about that. Yeah, I felt like a, with my list, I was actually taking uh, points off my Starvo matchup. Yeah. In uh, yeah, to get more, get a higher edge against something like Viserai and potentially the Mirror. Like my way of uh, attacking the Mirror was a bit different. Um, but like I was experimenting with two fractal replications. Um, two because I never want to draw two of them if possible ever. Um, and then I was also playing Coalescing Mirage, which is very interesting. But yeah, there's a lot of people that are quite passionate against Coalescing Mirage or Coalescence Mirage, uh, per se. This but against Starvo, and yeah, against Starvo and against a lot of these other decks, you're like, okay, they just never break it. It's just six with Gogan. That's under rate. I mean, that's like 15% of their life total. And you, you get like, that's a lot. I think, especially as Prism, like, that's a significant chunk. And if they're not even really considering breaking that most of the time, um, it's especially good with Fractal, right? So I think that it complements uh, a two Fractal package really nice because now your targets for Fractal are going to be Miraging Metamorph, Coalescence Mirage, and sometimes uh, well, you know, what can be assumed to be pretty often in a lot of matchups, uh, actually Herald of Erudition. So you know, obviously Starvo can pop it pretty easy, but against like Lexi, um, and, yeah, against the Mirror, against Lexi, and against uh, Chain you're reasonably likely to actually resolve that and not have it popped. And usually it's blocked, right? So it's not going to go into soul. So you can actually replicate it with Fractal Replication and have two Herald of Eridition. So it's, it's quite good in the mirror, I think. And I just wanted to experiment with a bit of a different package. And I opted to cut a lot of the, def the defensive package that existed in um, your list. Yep. Yeah, which in, in hindsight, I would uh, cut the Fate for Seasons I played. But yeah, it's um, Fractal. I think of Ian's Chain. That's the one, the one place I like that card. And, and we can, you know, we could. I'm sure we could talk about these lists for for days on end. But if you do want to hear a bit more about this Prism list, and especially the one that I played, you can go check out Session Blood. Session Blood did an interview with uh, the two New Zealand players, Jason and Justin, who sort of played this list in week one, first and second across the two, uh, the two Progress events there. So it's uh, the list I played is a very small tweak. And then you know Brennan's just talked about the few changes here, is there and why he played those. For me, it was more about I really wanted to stick to that aura plan, um, and I wanted to have. Uh, I was giving up some points, definitely giving up some points against Chain and um, even Viserai and uh, Briar for, for that, which I think I would not do this weekend. So I actually think maybe as much as I don't really like Fractal and I think it, can, it has a really low floor, if I was going to play it, I think this coming weekend might be the time to play it, which we'll yeah. talk about. You can definitely cut the Fractals. <laughs> the floor is low, like when you're getting pressured particularly, like if your life total... And especially if your hand is actually pressured, like via disruption, um, then Fractal can really suck. So it actually really sucks against like Ice Lexley and stuff, uh, funny enough. But other than that, I feel like you can actually, you can get the value out of it pretty consistently. Um, 
And I just like I just like the more proactive plan. I felt like the Starvo matchup was like super prison favored, so yeah. I opted to go way less D reacts in that case. Yep, yeah, yeah, which I agree. Actually, I was only playing two immovable into most of the Starvos and maybe mm-hmm. one or two sync blows max, but they can actually punish you for that. So yeah, no, I agree. I think the the one matchup where I like being super proactive and I like these like I want to be on this aura plan, I think, most of the time, but being really really proactive with like the red heralds so bringing the war tunes and potentially some fractals i think is really good against aggressive decks that you might need to race but don't have on hit effects so they're too quick for potentially this aura plan but you can put a lot of pressure on them and the pressure they put on you doesn't come with consequences so not ice lexi but chain and briar um which is something that yeah i think is going to be more prevalent in the meta this weekend so all that said um do you think prism is a good choice going forward for the rest of progress season brendan and why why not yeah, I think it is. Um, like, I think the deck in a vacuum is just extremely powerful. So uh, I think that it's a safe pick, actually, for, like, the rest of the season, unless there's some sort of Black Swan deck that comes out and just blows it out of the water. It does have bad matchups, right? Like, Chain isn't great. I, I think that Viscerai isn't great, and Briar is not is really rough, <laughs> like, terrible. Um, but, like, I think the deck got... S- just incredible upgrades in Everfest, and this aura game plan has really reached its sort of full potential. Um, so I really like the deck. I think that it's powerful just sort of on the delta against almost everything. That I think it's potentially something that you could play for the entire season, although I probably won't be. I'm, I'm, I've retired Prism, personally. <laughs> but mm-hmm. not because I don't think it's necessarily a good choice going forward. I think it is a worse choice going forward than it was this past weekend. Like I actually think significantly worse, but I agree with Brendan. I think the deck is still really powerful. You have this get, plan A is really powerful. And that's one of the things I think if you want to play a deck through a season, you want to play a deck into unknown metas. You want to play a deck that's going to still hold up as a, a meta evolves. You need a really strong plan A and Prism definitely has that. And of course, you know, Bravo Star of the Show I think it will go down like the win rate's going to go down on this hero uh but that doesn't mean it's not going to be there it's going to be there so having you know prism is still going to keep that in check and playing the deck that checks the most popular deck in the meta is always a, is always a solid pick um you know especially if it's one that does it so well and has a, has a really good plan there like we say why i think it might not be the best pick going forward is i really expect to see because of prisons prisons popularity and dominance this past weekend uh, i really expect to see and, and sorry to caveat that Starvo had another really good week, but Prism converted so well uh, on what it did in terms of the events that it won, uh, the amount of games that it was won for its its representation. And in certain regions was really represented, uh, especially I know in my region. Um, <clears throat> so that's something to really keep in mind is that you get to check this deck. But I think because of that popularity and rise, we're going to see Chain rise in popularity this week. We're going to see Briar come out, I think. It's something that's kind of had a few top eights so far. I think it's going to come out. I think Viscerai comes back up. I think people have been testing and, and learning that matchup against Starvo. People are feeling more confident about it in certain pockets. And I think that deck's going to come out. And all three of those are not matchups that I particularly want to play as Prism. So I think uh, as, a, as a pick going forward, I'd be a bit more hesitant. And um, personally, I'm not going to play it. But uh, even if I had, even if I felt like I was, I wanted to play it. I don't. I don't think I would because of you know the metagame kind of calls. Unless I knew that there was just going to be an abundance of the mirror and start with shot my meter and people weren't going to pick up chain but just cannot guarantee that yeah i think the viscera is extremely powerful um but i just i really have struggled with trying to figure out that that starvo matchup um like i found multiple plans where it's like okay this sort of has an edge now and then there's like a sort of the starvo changes their strategy and it's like wow that really punishes <laughs> like what what i'm doing now so I might even like I'm I'm actually experimenting with just like teching like nine cards and just running a different shell in Viscerai that's gonna be a bit more disruptive to try to just clear up that Starvo matchup because I feel like if I can clear up the Starvo matchup on Viscerai, um, it's probably the best deck in the format, in my opinion. Yeah. So I mean we we I don't want to descend too much, but I, I know people are really mm-hmm. interested in our kind of takes on how we play certain matchups. So how are you currently playing Viscerai into Star of the Show? Yeah, so I, I've really flip flopped here. Um, originally, I was playing Vexing Quillhand and was playing more of like a mid range that would do you know ten to fifteen damage, maybe even just go mid range the entire time, and it would combo off with Vexing Quillhand and just do like twenty to thirty damage, kind of out of the blue because that piece of armor is a little bit busted. Mm-hmm. Um, that strategy is just it's painful 
against Awakening, you, you end up, they just, <laughs> I don't know how many, you know, Awakenings Starvos are playing nowadays because they're worried about getting OTK'd. Three because but, it's broken. <laughs> yeah, three because it's broken. Because So when you play that strategy, if they get three value, like value, kind of valued Awakenings on you, you just, like, there's, there's no way. It's mm -hmm. so good. Um, so I experimented with OTK after that. OTK um, has really not been working for me. Never really did it. Like for me, it's I struggled initially into like you know then potentially playing Heart of Ice, making my sync blows and um, immovables really bad. And but you could still win. But now it's particularly bad be when you play OTK because the Starvo can just actually hold the pulse and not swing the weapon. And if you're at and it, it, that makes it so it's actually statistic statistically unlikely that they don't uh, Starvo activate Starvo's ability. And then what they'll do is like if you're on five plus rune chance and you're planning to kind of OTK, um, or maybe you're on something like eleven, even worse, you're actually only able to filter one card per turn unless you can play out non-attack actions on your turn. So you start not even being able to draw your deck, not generate rune chance, and you're just getting starvoed every single turn with things like you know just break grounds, autumn touches, like whatever it is. Um, it's a pretty brutal cycle. So I've struggled a lot with OTK, and yeah, to the final form. I'm uh, either going to be playing that mid-range uh, slash aggressive plan, like the mini combo plan, or uh, like I said, board in like nine cards that will um, be disruptive, specifically trying things like Reek of Corruption and stuff like that. I don't think you can play Consuming Volition because it's way too, it's way too efficient for, for Starva to block Consuming Volition, like block the Arcane and activate the Crown of Seeds, so negating the four attack on it, blocking with one card. But um, yeah, that's where I am right now with Viserai. A little bit of a detailed breakdown, but I've struggled with that matchup for sure. <laughs> well, I'm going to give the other side of it. I don't want to hold us up too long, but I think it's an interesting conversation. And Viserai is one of the best decks in the format and a deck that people clearly want to play and know about. So um, from, from my side, I'm definitely firmly on OTK. I think Awakening is just, just so powerful. I just don't think you can play into that card. Unfortunately, it's a bit of an... I, I, you know, we talked about the issues with Bravo Star of the show last week, and I was pretty adamant that I didn't have like a lot of issues with the design of the card, which you know I, I copped a bit of flack for, which is fine. But Awakening, on the other hand, I do, I do have some real some issues with uh, just because of it's a one card pivot and it's a, a massive one card pivot. You go get a pulverize, that's eighteen damage swing, you know, fourteen plus the four uh, for the next turn. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very strong. So. For me, it's it's OTK, and some of the considerations about trying to play around those things that Brendan just talked about for me is uh, I'm really dropping back on defense reactions, and I have to give like full credit to to um, Dan Dan Mackay, who I test with, who kind of met on that plan and and showed the strength of it. Um, drop back on the defense reactions to basically mitigate those things happening. So we are using your arsenal as a as a tool to basically mitigate that kind of only filtering one card. So that's living for Mordred Tides for become the Arc Knights. Uh, and then so when you are get pressured with a, they're just coming in with a read on his touch and then keeping that pulse back, not letting you do anything else. Okay, cool. I get to keep my hand and now I have the, the, the linchpin. I have the Mordred title to become the Arc Knight to have the big rune chain generator turn. And I only need a few of those realistically to get through the game. And then we're kind of off to the races. So yeah, I've definitely found the matchup. Um, I've been playing a lot of the star of the show side and a little bit of the Viscero side. And um, I think it's a plan that, that works quite well, but it is a matchup where there's so many things that can happen during the game. The star of the show can draw in so many different ways. They can fuse a lot early. They might fuse a lot late as you go towards your combo. It's a lot of decision points to be had. So it does feel like from the Viscero side, you have to make a lot of choices in that game. Yeah, for sure. So like where I would find trouble is when I would get to like that 11 rune chant range, like 10 plus where you have like a lot of rune chance, but not enough to significantly combo the player. I would arsenal usually the first Sonata that I would find. Um, and then I would hesitate to kind of play that out. And that's usually what would get stuck in arsenal as mm -hmm. I, you know, I lack the tools to generate more rune chance. I forgot to mention with this, this, if we do play the nine cards, it's going to be more disruptive or plans to be, I don't know how it will work. Uh, there is this idea of like sort of walking the dog against bravo where you walk them down to around 20 and you don't make a too much of a life differential in uh in your favor so they can't just blow you out with awakening and then when they get down to 20 you can i would probably be playing quill hand in the strategy and go for one of those quill hand combos it's like 20 or 30 get them low enough to where you know they can't just awaken and blow me out and kill me but yeah. <laughs> easier said than done, yeah. done of course because there's <laughs> a lot of rng with that with that hero what is it in points okay brendan well mm. why don't we talk a bit move on to topic number two if we will and talk about metagaming from a bit more of a broader perspective and talk about the last two weeks of ProQuest and heading into indianapolis and then even into pro tour just kind of what some of our approaches are yeah mm -hmm. for sure so i mean the best way to start this off aiden is what 
how do you define or how does Arsenal Pass define metagaming in Flesh and Blood? Great question. <laughs> so metagaming is basically surveying what is happening in the current format at any given time and uh, making a choice based on that observation, based on the information that you've gathered. So, uh, you know, a really great example of this is to say, okay, last week, this is what the meta representation was. And thanks to uh, what Tower Number 9 is doing on uh, fabtg.com weekly, they're uh, publishing the metadata. I think it comes out usually about this time, same time as the podcast. Um, you can go and see that, that you are able to look at that and go, okay, well, this is what the meta is looking like right now. This is the information I have. This is what knowledge is available. And that's where metagaming starts, right? That's what metagaming is, is taking that chunk of information and then making a decision based on that, which is in, in flesh and blood, deciding which hero, which strategy to play into that metagame to find success, uh, into that, sorry, into that format to find success. So yeah, I mean, that is that is effectively metagaming, right? And the, I guess the reasons why, right? Like, why is it important, Brendan? Mm-hmm. Well, before it's, before I talk about why it's important, one thing I want to note about metagaming, which um, it's just something to note, is that it doesn't mean always switching your hero to have the most effective yeah. you know, deck into that meta. Sometimes it's switching your um, just your hero's sideboard package, right? You can maybe lean into more tech cards for this deck or that deck and take out some stuff that's less relevant now. Um, but yeah, I just want to point that out because I know a lot of people are more attached to sometimes more attached to a singular deck and i think metagaming is relevant for you know people that are switching and playing a lot of heroes and also people that are just playing one but why is it important well i think that if you just played flesh and blood you know in a vacuum or just had your eyes closed to the meta you probably have a harder time winning tournaments than if you took in the data and responded to it um and i think that's what metagaming is you look at what's being played what's what's effective and you take the data and you make an informed decision on your end on what you're going to do to sort of take action on that and increase your win percentage, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, hey, why don't you give me your thoughts too? Because I'm trying. I feel like I'm trying to describe it and take the words out of your mouth, but you're really the the chef in this case. <laughs> it's about well, <laughs> thank you. I'll take that as a compliment, I guess. It's about saying one step ahead, right? That's that's literally what it is. Is if you have the data from last week, do you expect that to be the same this weekend? So do you expect the same representation? I mean, as soon as you break it down and think about it the answer is probably gonna be no right but if you just looked at that data and just said oh we'll just play the best deck this weekend you're kind of not you're not metagaming you're just taking okay well, what do i think is the best deck right now but you're already in the past you're already a week behind right and as players get better at this game and the level increases and we we see players start to think strategically about more about this game and that's happening a lot especially in in uh areas regions like north america uh europe and asia as these grow this is happening a lot where people are going, okay, well, I'm going to target that deck. I'm going to actively target it. And the meta is changing to next week. So that's why it's so important to to do it, is to stay one step ahead. And that kind of goes even beyond. And there's like a, I guess there's like a two-step approach, right? So you can stay one step ahead, which is basically metagaming. You know, okay, this is what happened last week. Now I'm looking at the present. So this is the past. This is the present. What about the future? That's kind of the next step, right? So how do I stay two steps ahead? Well, if I know that people are going to play, let's take week two as an example, right? If I knew that people are going to play a lot of Prism to target Starvo um, and some of the, you know, some of the things like maybe Runeblade were going to drop off, how would I metagame that? Actually, maybe maybe this is a great weekend to play Briar or even Chain. So it's about the one-step approach, the two-step approach, using the data from the past, looking at the future, sorry, looking at the present and then into the future about how to try and stay two steps ahead. So I think that's that's what metagaming is and it's important because it's going to give you win percentage. It's going to give you favorable matchups. You're going to go into this event with an idea of where the metagame was and where it is now and how you can take advantage of that to gain percentage points to have a better weekend i think that's exactly what happened for me this weekend is i'm not an expert prism player by any means i've played a little bit of prism i got a few games in this week but i think i had the right deck and the right list for the right weekend and that allowed me to you know play the metagame and get you know if i took viscera into that field and i look at my matchups i played i would have had a really really tough time especially on my saturday but having prism there uh made that you know made that decision uh, made that sorry made that event a lot easier because of the decision that was made to metagame yeah if we just look back at the recent new zealand uh national championship perfect tournament example. that is the perfect yeah the perfect example of metagaming um and staying like two steps ahead right the deck that won was probably briar's best one of Bri- i think it might have actually been briar's best matchup That's in the entire format 
yeah, it's like actually a buy. It feels like it, right? Maybe, maybe uh, you know, Nick. I think it was Nick holding the one, yep. right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. The, the maybe Nick holding. Yeah, maybe Nick holding had you know had a plan for Briar if he ran into it. But other than that, like from what we Aiden and I have experienced, like that is that is a bad match for Prism. It's like it's largely the reason that Prism fell out of the meta. So this player picked up that deck and was able to actually target all of the decks that were targeting Briar and completely dodge Briar, right? And just preyed upon all of the Guardian decks that had been uh, had been brought to the tournament to try to beat these Briar players. Yep. And they won, they won the tournament, which is like, it, and it, was, it wasn't very close with a lot of these Guardian players because that deck absolutely countered um, a lot of these, you know, these Guardians, these old hymns and Bravo. And, and Viscera. Which is, you know, mm-hmm. like, and Viscera, yeah, I, it's tough for Viscera. I kind of felt like I was, for, New, for Australian Nationals, I felt like I was maybe one and a half steps ahead. Because if you look at that last meta, like what Nick did, the, the, the past, so we just talked about past, present, future of a meta game and how to meta game. The past was Briar. That's what people were talking about. Lightning Briar, this, Mount, Channel Mount Heroic, this. Like, that was the, the past. That's what we'd seen through the national season. Present was Ultim. Ultim to combat it, play Guardian to combat these aggressive heroes. The future was prism right and maybe you could say this was somewhere in between that that um present and future in terms of staying steps ahead of the metagame and that's exactly what nick did you know understood it was a mixed format understood the risk that maybe he runs into one or two briar but had the deck to beat out these these um the next step over in swiss and in top eight and um that is literally what metagaming is to a t and uh i have no doubt that nick is much much better prison player than i am so that would have helped a lot as well but you know, that's that is what metagaming is so yeah staying steps ahead brennan so let's talk about that so how do we do that this weekend how do we do that for the remainder of the meta let's talk about in the context of the pro quest season week one was all about star of the show bravo week two was star of the show and prism the rise of prism was the story what do so that's our past what's our present this weekend like what do we what is what happens now to, to target that what do we see in the present for sure so uh, in order to answer this too, from like the fundamental perspective, is like you have great resources and the data that uh, is being provided on the Flesh and Blood website right now, but you can also contextualize that with your local meta, right? So my, you know, for instance, my local meta is going to heavily influence what I'm going to play next weekend, um, almost regardless of the data on the Flesh and Blood website. But let's yeah, let's talk about that, right? Because we had a lot of Prism come in, we had Prism perform effectively, and potentially now we expect less bravos in week three like finally probably a significant uh, qual- quantitative decrease in the number of starvos um and a lot of prisms right so how are you going to beat that well you can play prism um of course like Peyton did last weekend and you can just be ready for the mirror and that's probably good enough right that's a, that's a good plan um but now yeah if you're playing prism you have to worry about all those people that are going to try to be a step ahead and they're going to be playing the decks that are very good against prism maybe chains briars um, and viscerize. So you need to be, I think, more prepared for those matchups if you're planning to take Prism this weekend, which you may not have had to last weekend. For me, I know that I'm looking at a deck that's going to be targeting Prism and just has relatively strong matchups across the field, which is Viscerai. Um, I haven't totally locked it in, but I think that Viscerai might be the play for this weekend. But I'm not against playing something like an Earthbriar or even potentially a Chain. For me, I'm just not a fan of chain's current play pattern but uh, i think the deck is very powerful and it's it's very very good in the prism um but yeah briar's probably better <laughs> anyway yeah so that that is like you say right that is where we are right now why i expect to see a rise in rune blades this weekend to target prisms i probably expect that we're going <laughs> to see star of the show drop off ever so slightly i think some of those players might be frustrated with the prism matchup and drop over to maybe a viscerai or a chain even um, I think a lot of Prism players will double down. They will go back to the well this weekend. Uh, a lot of people will move to Prism. So with it, maybe some Sabo players move to Prism. I think we might even see, uh, you know, maybe like some Lexi players move to Prism or maybe even some some Viscerai players because of just how much the start of the show there was. I think there'll be a bit of a move around this week. And I think a good point you just talked about is like regionality. And that's something to consider. So, and only you can know how much to weight that. Like you, Brennan, you said, you know, it's going to be heavily considered for you my regionality of my metagame tends to change a lot we don't really have like super ingrained players who are dedicated to to certain heroes we, we have a few right that are like yeah we've got the we've got a couple of cartoon players we've got a couple of like brute players we've got a couple of like guardian players who always play whatever flavor of guardian they want to uh same with rune blade 
but in general like the the meta is pretty susceptible to change i went to a, uh, an event on saturday which was like you know just dominated by star of the shows and room blades and like no prism and then on sunday it was like all prism some star of the show and like no room blades no chain so it really depends i think uh in terms of mind but it is important to understand you know your local meta and maybe you're not going to a local meta and then maybe you just need to work on the data which i think is important so yeah i really expect to see rises in room blades i think uh, chain's gonna come up this weekend i think as i said briar's gonna come out from that so if we then we move on right to like the the third step so the, the future if we're trying to stay two steps ahead brendan if we want to target a deck that maybe is good into this week's meta and next week's meta what might you be looking at to do that then what's something that plays well into rune blades and still has game against prism but maybe you don't maybe you're not as worried about your style of the show matchup because you think prism's going to take care of that yeah so okay. what's good into rune blades and beats prisms uh, i think it's just another rune blade right now for me it's going to be viscerai um i would probably consider briar if i had a bit more reps on it um i'd probably play earth briar actually which is funny enough <laughs> that deck that never really got to see you know, competitive success back in the last meta um but yeah i think that viscerai is a good pick i think viscerai's matchup into prism is quite strong and its matchup into uh briar and chain are reasonable right like this deck was actually you know, a lot of the shell of this deck was actually developed to beat Briar back when Briar was not errata and had Plunder Run. Obviously now has Swarming Gloomvale and Revel and Runeblood, but I would argue that the version before was more powerful. So I think your one of your biggest biggest concerns is actually going to be Chain, and I think that that is probably Viscerai favored, um, but I haven't practiced it too much. So for me, I think Viscerai is going to be the pick, but you know, we can even go, you could probably, like if you go really deep down that rabbit hole, and you expect a lot of prism. Like, there's no reason why there can't be a Rhinar or something on your uh, on your your radar as well, right? I think that's very true. That would be where I would go to next. So I think if I look at week four of the ProQuest, as I think Prism just continues to pick up some steam, um, I think Lexi is a, a reasonable option. I don't think mm -hmm. that the matchup into Prism is fantastic, but I think there are builds where you can you can work to have a reasonable matchup. Uh, but it's, it's hard to be good against Prism and Star of the Show with Lexi, I think. So I think you've got to pick one or the other, and I think you're probably picking Prism, in which case uh, you're probably looking at some stuff that's also good into some of the Rune Blades, which is is a good place to be, I think. So that's that's important. Um, and then, yeah, Brute. I think Reina, Angela Olivia, I think these uh, heroes could have a good time into Prism-heavy meta and uh, one where, you know, maybe the, the dominant Rune Blade is, is uh, you know, is briar is chain um it would be interesting so it's gonna be meta picks for those weeks i think the the rhino pick might be a little bit tougher uh maybe olivia is a bit better position hmm. yeah that's definitely what you're playing i can literally hear it in your voice that, so that's the so Brendan, secret is that yeah <laughs> what are you playing this weekend what are you playing this right yeah, I'm 95% on this. I gotta, I gotta get these these reps in, trying a, a different plan into into Starvo. Um, if not, I think that I can probably ODK most Starvos anyway, because I think that you know, I've only really lost. I really, I only really lose to a single a single Starvo player so far with that ODK plan. So I think that it might not be replicated by everyone out there. So I probably default to ODK if I don't figure out a way to beat it. Other than that, but yeah, this ride for me because I think that Prism is a great matchup for Viserai, and I feel confident into Briar and Chain. I do not feel confident to other Viserais, because that mirror is dog water. It's okay. bad. Can I ask, is, <laughs> that, is that player that keeps beating your Starbucks, do they have a national trophy, by any chance? Um, mm, I think that that person needs more clout than they already have. Yeah, it is Tarek Patel. He was dunking on me. To be fair, Nah, he just beat me. I'm kidding. Yeah, he, just beat, he just beat me. <laughs> no excuses coming out. All right. Well, all right, Brendan. Yep, yeah, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be playing a brute this weekend. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's 100 percent the best medical. I think that probably, as I say, that a rune blade of some flavor, probably chain or briar. I think briar is a really good pick this weekend. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm gonna pick up a brute. I think it's a pretty reasonable position to play brute this weekend. I think this weekend or next weekend is a, is a good time. Uh, I. I'm probably going to play Livia, I think. Uh, the problem is, is I won't get to test this week. So I'm going to be going in off my previous knowledge of Livia and um, just some theory on how I want to play into matchups right now. So it could go poorly, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to play Livia. I will 
share the list that I'm going to play. Um, I think there's like a 10% chance I default to Reinar because I've played a lot more in this meta recently. Uh, but my concern with Reinar is I think that your room by matchups are like quite, you know, quite poor. Um, even if you mm. can build to be good into, I think you can have really good Prism and Starbo matchups, which is great. But I just can't guarantee that people are going to play a Rune Blade. I think if you want to win an event this weekend, you're going to have to beat a Rune Blade at some point, and that's really hard with Reinar. Whereas I think Livia could potentially do that. Although I think your Prism matchup is harder, so a bit of a, a bit of a give and take there. But I think probably for me ends up being that I'll play I'll play Livia. <clears throat> Spicy. There we have it. All right, so that's kind of our discussion on, you know, week two of Everfest Pro Quest, the metagame, how to metagame. Um, <clears throat> any sort of final things you want to talk about from a metagame perspective? Obviously, we are a few weeks out from Indianapolis. Are you already thinking about that from a metagame perspective? Are you already starting to think, yeah. how does Pro Quest end up and how do I start to look at metagaming for Indianapolis? Yeah, and I'm kind of stressing in the sense that, like, so far, this has been the most rock, paper, scissors format I think that Flesh and Blood has ever had. Which sounds really romantic until you actually play it, and you're like, "Wow, I like it, it's really a, it becomes more of a mitigating question than like uh, just really getting the reps on a specific deck. Like, I feel like you want to be playing the right deck because there's such polarizing matchups currently in the meta. Mm-hmm. So, Good, cool. um, yeah, I'm not sure what I'm gonna play uh, yet, and I think that that's not gonna be figured out for a while because I mean, if it's all Starvo, I'm definitely not playing Viserai into that unless I figure out something that's unique. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm looking at Briar at this point. I'm, I'm looking at Briar. I'm, obvi- I'm definitely, I'm definitely currently on Viserai. If I can make that one matchup okay, then Viserai is probably going to be my pick. But I think that Earth Briar is, uh, it's a good deck. You know, that deck didn't really, didn't really um, rely on getting a ton of embodiments like the Lightning deck did, because uh, it was more tall. As well as, uh, you know, it utilized Red Plunder Run, but it wasn't running like a 9 of, um, and it wasn't super key to its game plan. So I think that, that that deck is potentially still very strong and got upgrades with both Swarm and Gloomvale, which is obviously incredible off of <laughs> Channel Mount Heroic, another zero cost with, you know, Go Again likely, and uh, Revel in Runeblood. So looking at that deck. What about you? I just what about I- you for the... I just what, sit here with, I'm just sitting here with Livia up at the screen, just holding holding the hero up to see how long it would take Brennan to to acknowledge. I can't. I lady. can't actually. I can't actually see the camera, but <sighs> I will. I will tab over if you That's change gone. that Livia out for your gold foil, <laughs> <laughs> and we open Put that bad boy. Put it away. What are you thinking, Hayden? Are you thinking about the pro tour yet? Uh, no. So what I'm thinking about is innovations what are we what are we not touching on right now so i think the metagame is going to evolve over the next few weeks and i think that is going to evolve within what we already know i don't expect to see any crazy decks come out over the next next two weeks so my sort of thoughts right now is like where's the innovation like where do we go next uh there's certain cards on my radar that i really want to explore earthful bounty is one of those i think that that a piece of equipment is very very strong uh, i always look at equipment as like the base of that there's some other cards out there. I think um, even bigger than that is a really strong card. Like, where is the right home for that card? Uh, is there is there something there? And then is there like archetypes out there that we just aren't we just aren't looking at right now? And that's kind of where my my mind is starting to go to as we close out this pro quest season. I'm not going to be playing Indianapolis. I'm going to be staying right here in Australia, so that's not really a concern for me. So my attention is starting to shift basically now to you know where do we go next from this meta? I don't expect to see massive. You know, I don't expect to see a Lightning Briar, for instance, you know, that kind of type of thing show up in Indianapolis like it did uh, in the Tales of Aria meter and just disrupt the whole meta. I'm really not expecting that. So I think Bravo Star of the Show was that for Everfest and that's already happened. And now we're, where do we go now? Now we're in the stage of, if we compare it to the last meta, what's the, what's the hybrid Viserai? What's the, what's the potential like Prism upgrade? You know, like those are the kind of things from the last meta is where I think my, my thoughts are starting to go now. So yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's actually really interesting right now because some of the top decks are extremely con- uh, constricting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you could probably say that Briar, you know, Lightning Briar definitely was constricting on the meta and really hated out the other aggro decks and the, and the decks, the mid range decks. But, you know, Starvo is constricting on the, on the meta in a different way than Prism, but is, you know, doesn't let a lot of things be viable. And Prism does the same thing, actually, which is funny. Prism hates out, like, very much hates out a lot of decks being an extreme counter, um, but is susceptible to other decks coming in. So I think if those decks, like if Prism and Bravo some, or Starvo somehow move out, like our meta actually opens more. And it's like, how much do the, do the Rune Blades 
um, affect what decks are able to be played at that point. And like, I, I mean, seriously, if there was, if there was no, if there was literally no prism, there would be other decks we'd start talking about, right? Like there'd be other decks that would be on our radar. Yeah. Um, when you, you, even potentially like Dorinthia, like Dorinthia for me is like, I don't even consider it because, um, I just think the prism match is so bad. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that that's interesting and that that's really what will lead to this potential, you know, unique metagame in, uh, in Indianapolis, or probably the Pro Tour, because Indianapolis is too soon. soon. I mean, you've just described why metagaming is so important and how important metagaming is in Everfest. It may have been a little bit less in Tails, although actually was it, as we see with New Zealand Nationals. But yeah, I think you've just described exactly why I, I think that this format is a lot more open than Tales of Ari, because I think that, yes, there's some decks that are restrictive, but they have clear counters that are very viable plan A decks. The, my problem with the last format is that the you know the counter we got to for briar was like this old time deck but then you know like if you wanted to play prism you just had no game into these these briar decks whereas okay now starvo is the big scary bad guy prism is a really clear counter and has a really good plan a in this format and is just a good deck so i think that kind of changed the dynamic so we i think we would get into a bit of a rabbit hole as we talked about last week around we sit on opposite sides of the fence currently of like the star of the show debate um, but it is one that is kind of def- defining the format. But I think it's my personal opinion is that it defines the format less and less as we go. So um, we'll see how wrong I am and what happens. But Brendan, why don't you? To take be fair, a- I do. I do agree with you. To be okay, fair, I do right. agree with you. I, I just, I just literally hate the design. The design. And that's it. That, yeah, and I think that its uh, its effectiveness was more than they maybe planned. But we'll see, right? I might be alone on that in, in that in that group of uh, thought. But either way, anyway. My favorite section. Plug in the dial-up internet. You've got a review for us from the Google. Yes. <laughs> Plug in the dial-up. Yeah, we're going back in time. We've got a, got a Google review. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't get a funny one quite yet, but we did get a oh, nice, nice review from Chaos Monkey. He says, two great players hitting key aspects of an excellent card game. If you play, you don't want to miss it because other players are definitely learning from this cast. Well, thank you so much for the nice words, Chaos Monkey. And I do hope that someone gives us Something that gives Hayden a chuckle. He needs some more happiness in his life. So <laughs> let's see if we can make Hayden laugh next week. And maybe if we do, he'll open the golf wall for us. He'll always try. All right, Brendan. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode 47 of Arsenal Pass. Before we go, a couple of shout outs. If you're not already checking out our gameplay uh, up on YouTube, we have gameplay deck techs. Um, and all those deck techs we do, whenever we do a deck, a, you know, a deck preview, uh, sorry, a deck tech, we will throw a dick guide up on our Patreon as well, which goes through sideboarding plans, ethos behind. Uh, we put up a lot of like, you know, kind of numbers and, and why certain things are done. Twitter as well. Both me and Brendan are on Twitter. Brendan is at uh, Brendan APG. I'm at Fian underscore Dale, like the tunic. Follow us for fab related things. Add us, ask questions. We like, you know, interacting and, and chatting with everyone. Um, we like to post updates for events and, and deck lists that we play as well. So yeah, big thanks to all the patrons again. And uh, remember that giveaway we've got for that golden ticket for Indianapolis. If you do want to get involved and, and get your hands on that, then drop a comment in this video below. Tell us what you're excited about for Indianapolis. And finally, uh, go and check out the videos that we're doing up on fabtcg.com with LSS. And um, you know, leave us a, a like or a nice comment on their YouTube channel as well if you'd like. No pressure. Otherwise, Brendan, <laughs> until, uh, until next time, good luck to everyone playing ProQuest this weekend. And uh, hope you grab some golf balls.